I'm, I'm so delighted to uh, welcome you to the uh, 23rd annual Dorothy J. McLean Fellows Conference. Um, this conference um, celebrates and remembers uh, Dorothy McLean, um, who helped us uh, organize and establish the McLean Center and always remain deeply committed to its work. Um, Mrs. McLean uh, believed throughout her life that education was the best way to improve the world um, and throughout her life supported many educational initiatives and institutions uh, from her alma mater at Colorado College uh, to uh, schools where her husband had gone Yale and her children had gone Dartmouth um, and supported the McLean Center. Uh, we particularly want to recognize and acknowledge Marianne and Barry McLean, uh, who have been such grand supporters of the center and uh, that, who are the co-chairs of our center advisory board. Marianne and Barry, thank you. Uh, it, it's their support that has allowed us to uh, continue to have conferences like this, uh, but also to help the McLean Center work to improve patient care uh, by focusing on the practical clinical ethics problems uh, that, that confront all of us in taking care of patients. Um, today's program, as you, as you know, is centered on the topic of medical professionalism. Um, it was Francis Peabody in his 1927 uh, essay who wrote that medicine is not a trade to be learned, but a profession to be entered. Uh, sentiments like that uh, had, been, uh, had been around medicine throughout the 19th century and even in the late 18th century. But in recent decades, uh, there has been a renewed focus uh, in medical education on professionalism. Uh, professionalism being seen as a way to improve patient care, to strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, to reduce conflicts of interest, to improve physician self-regulation, and ultimately to strengthen the alliance between medicine and patients and society. Uh, this afternoon's program uh, promises to explore those kinds of matters uh, as we go forward. Chris Castle um, will, will uh, be our second speaker. Uh, Chris is a leading expert in internal medicine, geriatrics, med geriatric medicine, and medical ethics, and is president and CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine and their foundation. Um, Chris is the past president of the American Federation for Aging Research and of the American College of Physicians and has served as dean of the School of Medicine and vice president at Oregon Health Sciences University. Chris is an active scholar and lecturer, the author, a co-author of 14 books and many, many journal articles, um, and is, I, I must add, a graduate of the University of Chicago College. Professionalism is not a nostalgic, old-fashioned idea, nor is it irrelevant, but that it, in fact, is redefining itself, and that we and people in the field of bioethics and those of us who are thinking seriously about the future of our healthcare system in the United States need to be part of that redefinition. The triple aim which uh, Don Berwick has brought to the CMS and to the healthcare reform effort is not only part of the challenge, but is part of the answer. Um, so what, this is the big challenge for us. Can we have affordable health care where everybody has access and we still have good quality? Can you actually have all three of those? And I would say the answer is not without physician engagement and leadership. But I hope to show you some thinking about actually a hopeful way in which the profession can um, be part of the solution. So I don't have to show you this. You've seen millions of different versions of this, but just, this just compares the rise in healthcare costs to that of every other developed country. And 
ought to be telling us that there's got to be a better way to do this. So in the United States right now, this really huge experiment is going on, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, this major investment in healthcare technology and healthcare redesign, which I think we should not underestimate the significance of, because with our support, that is to say, us in the profession, and that includes the whole um, uh, world of providers, hospitals, and physicians, and other health professionals, actually might be able to come to some of these changes in how we approach health care. So there's four things I want to point out. One is a disruptive realignment of economic incentives, absolutely essential. So the experiments are primary care medical homes, accountable care organizations, other kinds of innovations with people who are the most costly of the, of the beneficiaries, both for Medicare and Medicaid. But it's also the case that we don't have to invent this from scratch. There are uh, uh, healthcare delivery systems around the country that, for, that have the lowest cost and the highest quality and do relate to all three of those principles. So we have examples we can look to. Secondly, and importantly, a reduction in information asymmetry. There's now an open government.gov website that has some healthcare data, and just as of this year, uh, health cost and pricing data. So the idea is that people should know what they're being charged for things. I don't know if you've ever tried before you're having an elective procedure to find out how much it's going to cost. Impossible. And just having those prices of things be more visible, um, uh, many economists and others believe will really help to level the playing field and make us question the value of some of these expensive things that are, in fact, waste or could be considered that. Third, in, in, improved information at the point of care. So evidence about comparative effectiveness, both for physicians and for patients. Do I really need this? Isn't there a less costly way to get a better result? Decision support. Doctors can't carry all this in their minds, so they need electronic, real-time, evidence-based uh, decision supports, which are out there now. There's a growing entrepreneurial area in the cloud, if you will, of um, these kinds of decision supports. And finally, personal health records, that not only do we need electronic records for the doctor's office in the hospital, but we need the patient to be able to have access to that information in real time themselves. And then, of course, the dream of the pervasive use of IT that we put lots of money, both from the previous stimulus bill and from the ACA, into the adoption of what every other advanced industry already has been doing for a long time, which is electronic, seamless, interoperable information so that whenever you're taking care of a patient, you have the relevant information about that patient in front of you. So in that context, where are the doctors? That's what I want to talk to you about here. Um, and I want to do so by um, referring back to Julian Legrand, who is a British um, social economist who was a leader in, the, in Britain just after World War II when the National Health Service was being founded and after that time. I had the pleasure in the paper that's cited here of collaborating with a young physician, Sachin Jain, who is a um, uh, resident at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, who took a year off um, to be special assistant to David Blumenthal at the Office of National Coordinator, implementing the uh, HIT, um, the beginning of the uh, uh, HIT efforts of the federal government. And then he was stolen by Don Berwick to be Don Berwick's special assistant for another almost a year, starting up the efforts at ACA and Medicare. And he's now gone back to the Brigham to finish his residency because he told me he wanted to be board certified internist. So I said, well, that's a good idea. But he's, he's a brilliant young guy. And he and I were talking about this issue of the changing role of physicians. and looked at this paper by Julian Legrand where he's describing the attitude of the social policy maker towards the public. So when he's thinking about it, it's mostly about consumers. 
that when the National Health Service and the whole British welfare state came in, they generally thought of the citizens of the UK as good people trying to live their lives, do the right thing, and they just needed a government handout occasionally to help them along. And then as the years and decades went by and budget issues came up, there started to be more of a sense that they were gaming the system and trying to do things to get more money that they really didn't deserve. That's the knave in the system. And all of the social policymakers were trying to figure out how can we put incentives in place that will get them to do the right thing and not the wrong thing, that is to say pawns. So that in his view, the British public sort of just waited for the next government initiative to figure out, well, what does the government want us to do now? And then they figure out how to respond to that. So what I want to do is try to apply this concept to 21st century physicians in the United States um, and to ask this question, how do we use incentives without undermining socially positive motivations? So Legrand in his article quotes these two people, you know, it's more than a century apart, but um, uh, one is David Hume who has a fundamentally knavish view of human uh, nature and thinks that any system of government basically has to counteract avarice and ambition because people are not interested in other people's well-being, they're only interested in their own well-being. He counters this with Richard Titmuss, who's a, someone who bioethicists have studied about the gift relationship, and Titmuss argues that you shouldn't, in his book about blood donation, you shouldn't pay people to donate blood because then you'll undermine their altruistic motivations in doing so, and then it'll just become a financial transaction rather than a true gift. So, you can say what you think. My guess is that for most of us, there's a range of human behavior and a range of motivations, and we need to be careful about the Titmus um, worry when we think about incentives for doctors. But we also need to be realistic that doctors are working with the incentives in front of them right now, and that's what's gotten us in part where we are. So the question then is another triangle. What motivates physicians? We have, on the one hand, what I think of as an intrinsic motivation. And actually, there's a lot of pretty good survey data about both doctors and about what the public expects and thinks of doctors that suggests that there is an intrinsic professionalism. There are patient-centered values. It's not all just a market transaction. But the fact of the matter is that there are these intrinsic motivations, and you get what you pay for. So if you have a, a system that pays for more volume, you're going to get more volume, and therefore the government or the payers put in place regulation, the third part of the stool, because you want to control those incentives being sort of overblown. Uh, so let's ask ourselves this same question. Is, are the doctors knights? Are they basically good people and we need to just give them the space to do the right thing on behalf of the patients? Are they knaves? They're really just in it to make money and we need to put a lot of regulations in place to make sure that they don't harm patients and that they don't raid the public good in doing so? Or are they pawns? If we just get the incentives just right, they'll do the right thing. Um, and I would argue that at the center of this question, at least for me, and particularly in a lot of the places I um, interact with policymakers these days, it's all about pay for performance. There is this idea that we just need to change the payment strategies and pay doctors for doing the right thing, and then we'll get a better result. And so a great deal of thought has gone into that. A great deal of money has gone into that as well. So this is really a turning point for us in the United States. If we think we can claim to be knights, and I think if you, what you just heard from Arthur is that at least not all of us can make that claim, and certainly not all the organizations that represent us. But if we wanted to claim that, it would be the old world of just trust us, we're the doctors, we know what's best, we always do what's best for the patient, and of course, we take social responsibility into account. If we're knaves, then we put self-interest first then we need more, even more regulation, even more liability risk, and we have to make sure that patients' rights are really enforced because they can't trust the doctors. 
And if they're pawns, then it's just tell us what to do. If you're going to pay us to do this set of tests, we'll do this set of tests. Give us some algorithms and we'll do um, what the algorithm says. Very limited freedom of decisions, some of the things that I think a lot of people are worried about um, with comparative effectiveness, but in, they don't, they're not seeing comparative effectiveness as a tool rather than as a limit. So I'm not gonna go through this slide or the next one in great detail, but I put this up here. I've been playing around with this idea lately about the complexity of the role of being a physician. And I wanna sort of point out that these notions of complex and complicated, Hollywood know this, are part of how we think about medical education, that there is a complicated part of medical, of medicine, um, which is the technical part, all of the different things that you need to understand about human physiology and human pathology and, um, and the treatment of illness. And then there's the complex part, which is about dealing with human beings and the subtleties and nuances that um, are part of human reaction, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with situations where you don't know actually what's likely to happen or where there could be multiple influences on some kind of uh, uh, impact. And then you add to that all of these different roles that we actually expect doctors to play in our society, relating to the patient, relating to companies that are selling things that they need, relating to insurance companies, relating to institutions like hospitals, relating to consumers in the marketplace, relating to society, and particularly in this issue of stewardship. Well, so it gets more complicated. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like now with healthcare reform in place, okay? So we have um, uh, uh, all of the efforts to try to insert various different programs, some of them opportunities for huge creativity, some of them incentives like pay for performance, some of them ways of getting more information like comparative effectiveness and uh, 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 other kinds of value purchasing um, information to the physician. Um, but it's both complicated and complex. This is my office assistant does this. I don't do this myself, so I can't take credit for it. But it just gives you a sense that when we're trying to create incentives for doctors and try to create payment that actually gets results for consumers, this is not a linear process or relationship. And it's gonna be very hard as we think about looking at the results of these innovations to make sure that we're producing quality of care for the patients. One way to think about it is, let me just turn to this, is complexity theory. This is a cartoon about complexity theory. The cat's figuring out how to get this ball off the table, right? Um, and to my mind, we lit, what I want to show you now is that doctors are surrounded and increasingly surrounded by people measuring them, people evaluating them, a whole world of measures that are going to tell us, are we getting quality of care or not? Are we getting efficiency of care or not? And if you think of healthcare as being what's inside that complex little box diagram, and then ask yourself, how many of these outcomes are measurable and are we measuring the right thing? And the measures are for all these kinds of purposes, for differential payment, for meaningful use of health information technology, for public reporting, report cards about doctors, some from the government, some from um, private sector, to feed back to the physicians so that they can improve a very important role of measurement for licensure and increasingly for maintenance of certification for specialty certification. And this is just to make your eyes glaze over because it's what happens to me when I go to these meetings and we slog through hundreds of these measures to say now which ones really are the measures that are gonna tell us what are the good quality healthcare. So these are just a few of the 240 measures that are currently being used in the Medicare pay for performance scheme called physician quality reporting. And they're very linear. Each one of them is a very little, like did you prescribe this kind of thing for asthma or did the um, uh, hemoglobin A1C for the diabetic reach this level? So each one of them is very specific and not comprehensive and not looking at the, the whole picture. And then you have all these people 
entering the field. The commercial world is blooming with people who want to put out doctor report cards. Because consumers in this world are getting, paying more out of pocket and getting more and more nervous about making sure they know what they get. And each one of these entities has advantages and disadvantages, different ways of using measures. None of them, except with the possible exception of consumer reports, is very evidence-based, but they are all very successful and people are looking for ways to evaluate what they're getting when they go to a physician. What are the results of all of this effort of public reporting of measures about doctors? Well, I want to first, and I think I see Troy Brennan sitting back there, so I can give Troy some credit here. Um, we know that the medical malpractice system, which has been our kind of time-honored way of sort of getting rid of, quote, the bad doctors and compensating physicians, uh, patients who've been harmed, Troy's work and that of people since that have time have shown that it not only does it not compensate adequately people who've been harmed, but it really doesn't lead to overall better care, and we see that on all our national quality of care um, scores. For pay for performance, we actually have seen progress in the hospital arena, and I, wanna, I want you to remember that, because I think that's really important, that um, when you look at a whole institution and you put some performance goals out there and you attach money to it, you can see real progress, and that's happened with the Medicare uh, pay for performance efforts in the hospital. But so far, the, trying to do the same thing for doctors has not shown nearly the same kind of dramatic results. And in fact, the metrics that have shown results are just those where the payment is attached, and then, like in the VA, other things actually get worse. So that's the pawn thing that I think we want to avoid, that we're only just teaching to the test here. So what about just putting the uh, uh, information out there, letting the public decide? Well, so far, the public hasn't shown great interest in this tremendously granular reporting of the doctor did good on this and not so good on that. They just want to know who's a good doctor and how can I find somebody I can trust. So there seems to be a need to really um, figure out how this information is used. The one place that it does seem to actually produce quality is when you share it with other doctors within a, a system of care where people work together. Physicians are very competitive people. They're, when there's peer pressure and you're looking at how each other are doing, then you talk to each other about, well, how can we actually get our scores better with asthma? Or how can we actually make the patient satisfaction um, improve? That's the place internally where you've seen, at least to date, most demonstrable results. Well, what about standards from the profession? Can we really expect self-regulation, the profession, ourselves, to contribute to this problem with quality and with cost? The state licensing boards, as you know, are mandatory legally requirement. They're government run, although they have um, consumer, strong consumer pre uh, presence on them. But they're very much minimum standards, and while they're being um, upgraded and there's going to be a, a, a higher level for state licensing going forward called maintenance of licensure, um, you really have to look to the specialty certification boards to get more specialty specific higher standards that include performance standards. Now the, um, the 24 member boards of the ABMS include these specialties, internal medicine, the one that I uh, have the privilege of leading, is the largest of these by far, but all of them have agreed to this combination of assessing knowledge and whether you're up to date and also assessing performance. And that's the reason why we're interacting with all of these other entities that are trying to measure doctor performance because we're trying to reduce the burden of unnecessary measures and trying to bring all of this effort together in a way that can be independent and available to the public. But so, uh, as many of you know who have maybe done maintenance of certification um, or are afraid to do it, um, it is a lot of work. You have to actually um, take an exam, often more than one, if you have more than one specialty, um, and uh, evaluate the quality of care in your practice, submit the data, have a result, improve it. Why do they do this? It's not required. 
There's not any legal requirement. It's not part of a pay for performance scheme of any kind. We've surveyed the uh, tens of thousands of physicians who come through the ABIM every year doing this. And the fascinating thing to me is that most of them say the reason they do it is because of professional image, which I think is really interesting. It's a kind of a pride in the profession. It's not because they get paid more to do it. It's not because their job depends on it. Um, and the other answers they gave is update knowledge, patient quality of care, and finally, lower down on the scale, required for em employment. Now, that may be changing. We're actually seeing more and more concern from our diplomates when they don't pass the exam that they're going to lose their jobs. So I'm hearing that hospitals and health plans and medical groups increasingly are requiring this, I think because of this concern about quality and because of looking at, some, at something that might be publicly recognizable as a marker of quality. So we feel that we have a responsibility, too, to be part of the answer to this solution. But I want to highlight that just because I think Board certification, in a way, is a lever that has grown up within the profession that we ought to be able to take advantage of as a kind of a self-motivating factor. These commitments to professional competence, improving quality and access, just distribution of finite resources, as well as scientific knowledge, are all very much a modern interpretation of that responsibility to the patient. And it, you have to then ask yourself, so what motivates doctors and how can some of these positive levers be used to really get to the public good? And this I'm going to go over very quickly, but I want to recommend to you a report that just came out in March of this year called Pay for Performance in Healthcare Methods and Approaches by the RTI Press. It was a study that was contracted for and done by scientists at RTI looking at this question of what works in pay for performance, what doesn't work, and how could it be, um, how can the good part be advanced? So just very quickly, in economics, the, the economics of pay for perform performance is actually not good, and if it just take it at face value. The, there's the principal agent problem. The, the patient is never really going to have enough information to sort of shop around for at the perfect kind of treatment for this condition or that condition. That isn't why they come to uh, medical care in the first place. The most pay for performance incentives are too small to really counter the really strong drivers of fee for service or fear of malpractice. And that individual, rewarding individual doctors disincents cooperation and collaboration, which is exactly the care coordination that Arthur told us we need. And at least to date, as I told you, the literature is not very compelling on results. Now, I have sociology up here, and with Paul Starr in the audience, I'm um, uh, hesitant to put this forward, but the RTI experts have said that um, there is, in fact, an internalization of professional behavior in medical education, and that's why an institution like this one and is so important, and, and like the other medical schools around the country, that we could change how we talk about the responsibility of the profession from the sort of hierarchy, meritocracy, and intense personal responsibility to a sense of a, more of a collective responsibility and be able to change some of these things. The clinical realities is that these linear measures of care are not usually what the normal process of care is. It's much more uncertain, much more complex, and you need to act in the face of that uncertainty. And then there's also tremendous external pressure, pressure for deprofessionalization with um, all of this um, kind of sense that you're in a small business, you need to be a successful business person, you need to document what you do, you need to get paid for it, and it's up to the patient to be the consumer, caveat emptor. Um, and to my mind, if that's where a market-based healthcare system takes us, then I think we would have lost something precious and serious. Now, Eric Campbell and David Blumenthal and Paul Cleary at Mass General did this study using the charter as a template in which they asked people, do you believe in all these values of the charter? The doctor said, oh yes, we believe, they saluted 90%. And yet, when you asked them about their actual behavior, there were great gaps and shortfalls in what they actually did. 
They were not disclosing medical errors. They weren't reporting incompetent colleagues. They uh, admitted to ordering all kinds of unnecessary exams. They refused to see uninsured and poor patients. And um, they also didn't maintain their certification, which was a question we wanted to ask them. So I think what you're seeing here is the pressures externally really are difficult, and the profession is struggling. Um, in the psychology part of the RTI report, they point out that we really ought to be working more with intrinsic motivators than with extrinsic motivators, which is that doctors really like to accomplish diff difficult tasks. They like to learn new skills. They actually like collegial relationships with peers. And when you put them in a comprehensive group where everybody's held accountable for the goals, then, in fact, you tend to get a much better result. So in organization theory, that's what happens, that you have a management culture. You don't want the doctors to all become managers and thinking about this sort of bottom line all the time. But you do want to take advantage of the physician values in getting them to work together in this culture where you bring responsibility for individuals together with a responsibility for a defined population. That's exactly what the CMI uh, innovations are doing. So quality improvement requires leadership, a culture of learning, working in teams, information technology, and patient engagement. Those are all things that are becoming more a part of medical education these days and medical training. And I would argue that our institutions of medical learning need to themselves become exemplars in these areas so that the people who <coughs> study in there in those settings would be able to resist this external environment where it is headed in the wrong direction and that maybe pay for performance in the right configuration could in fact enhance professionalism rather than damaging professionalism. The keys to getting that kind of result are physician trust in the measures and standards. They have to believe that these measures actually mean something and that they reflect something that's of value to the patient. And they have to change, in many cases, thinking about how they work in an organizational culture. So just in conclusion, I want to point out, and this is from a, a New York Times article um, a couple of years ago, in the midst of the whole debate about healthcare reform, that the systems that have demonstrably produced good quality of care with defined populations at lower cost are all systems where the doctors are on salary, they're not paid fee for service, where there is a culture of sharing comparative data about their own performance with each other internally within the institution, and where they have a rich data environment where they really know what they're doing and they're able then to understand if patients are not getting quality of care and do something about it. So I think professionalism is not only not irrelevant, it's essential. But to my mind, it's a new kind of professionalism. It's a professionalism that leaves behind these old ideas of what the nostalgic profession was and becomes committed to collaboration, to evidence, to measurement, and transparency so that it's not at odds with accountability, but it, in fact, becomes accountability. So just so I can get some sense that this is a challenge for many of us, and it's going to take change, it's easy. The first step is to entirely change who you are. Um, so that is true for many of our institutions of medicine that have been so traditionally siloed and independent and personal accountability is everything. But this is what modern leaders in healthcare um, are challenged with. And this is what I think some of the new um, uh, arrangements for care are going to demand of professionalism. So the answer to the question I started with, are all three possible? Yes, with physician engagement and leadership. Thank you. The second panel will include, uh, the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Troy Brennan, will be followed by Professor Paul Starr, 
and then uh, Professor Richard Epstein will speak third. Uh, let, let, me, let me introduce the three speakers um, so that we can move ahead through the three talks. Um, Troy Brennan uh, currently is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for CVS Caremark, the nation's largest pharmacy healthcare company. In this role, Dr. Brennan has responsibility for the company's Minute Clinic, Accordant Healthcare, Clinical and Medical Affairs, and to help develop healthcare strategy. Previously, Dr. Brennan served as the Chief Medical Officer for Aetna, the nation's third largest health insurer, and before Aetna, Dr. Brennan was President and CEO of Brigham and Women's Physician Organization in Boston, and served also for that hospital as Director of Quality Measurement and Improvement. In his academic work, uh, Dr. Brennan served as Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and as Professor of Law and Public Health at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Brennan received his MD and MPH from the Yale Medical School, a JD from Yale, a master's degree from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Um, today, Dr. Brennan will speak on the topic, Professionalism Theory to Action, the Case of Conflict of Interest in Prescription Medications. He'll be followed by Paul Starr, uh, the Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University, and the co-founder and the co-editor of the journal The American Prospect. Uh, at Princeton, Professor Starr holds the Stewart Chair in Communications and Public Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School. He received the 1984 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction and the Bancroft Prize in American History for his well-known book, The Social Transformation of American Medicine. Um, uh, Professor Starr wrote a short book in 1992 entitled The Logic of Healthcare Reform, laying out the case uh, for a system of universal health insurance and managed competition. And during 1993, he served as a senior advisor at the White House in the development and formulation of President Clinton's health plan. Um, uh, P Professor Starr's most recent book, published uh, just a few weeks ago, is entitled Remedy and Reaction, the Peculiar American Struggle over Healthcare Reform. And it traces healthcare reform in this country from its beginning to its current uncertain prospects. Professor Starr's topic will be uh, professionalism as a public resource. And the third speaker in today's panel is Richard Epstein, who is the Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law at New York University, uh, and the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, here at the university, uh, we continue to recognize Richard as the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Law and as a senior lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, Richard remains among the most productive legal scholars in the country. Uh, his many books are well known to, to many of you. Takings in the 18, 1985, uh, Forbidden Grounds, The Case Against Employment Discrimination Laws, 1992, uh, Mortal Peril, Our Inalienable, Inalienable Rights to Healthcare, uh, published in 1997. What, Richard? Oh, question mark. Que I, question mark. Um, and, and on and on. Uh, in keeping, in keeping I, I love this part of Richard. In keeping with his reputation as a polymath, Richard has taught courses in the law school in the following disciplines. Civil procedure, communications, constitutional law, contracts, corporations, criminal law, health law, legal history, labor law, Roman law, property, real estate development, jurisprudence, torts, workers' compensation, it, it goes on. Today, Richard is going to speak about will the deprofessionalization of medicine improve quality of care. Uh, let, let me begin um, by, by calling up uh, Professor uh, Troy, uh, Dr. Troy Brennan uh, for the topic, Professionalism, Theory to Action, the Case of Conflict of Interest in Prescription Medications. Troy. It's 
it's a narrower topic than um, the uh, speeches that were uh, just delivered, and I don't know whether that's good or bad. It kind of reminds me of a story that my friend Tom Lee likes to tell, who's a humorist and, and a doctor, about he and his brother, who were both cardiologists, and uh, his brother Richard went into research, and Tom went into general medicine. Tom was having to learn sort of more and more different topics in order to be a generalist, and uh, seemed like he was grasping kind of less and less about each of the topics. Meanwhile, Richard was sort of drilling in on a very specific topic and learning more and more and more um, about uh, very ever sort of smaller things so that uh, they decided between them that, you know, Tom was in danger of knowing nothing about everything and Richard was in danger of knowing everything about nothing. Um, and I'm afraid this might be on the sort of Richard side, but it's a little story about uh, conflicts of interest and uh, medical ethics, and I think it raises some interesting questions from the point of view of sort of how professionalism should um, operate. So uh, these are my disclosures. I work for CVS Caremark, and I'm on the board of a couple of nonprofit organizations, and I was formerly on the board of the American Board of Internal Medicine. The important thing is that a lot of what I'm say going to say is based on empirical insights that disclosures really don't make any difference. In other words, it's not going to change your view of anything I do, me having disclosed that. And that's relatively important to the overall um, you know, um, uh, machinery of the lecture, I guess. And these are the key questions. You know, so the first one is, can a new formulation of medical ethics that emphasizes the importance of professionalism make a difference at all in the healthcare system? And drilling in on that a little bit, you know, will attention to uh, the professional contact, uh, conduct in specific instances lead to self-imposed changes in which the way the uh, profession behaves? So, you know, the whole idea here is to explore whether or not sort of ideas and structure of ideas can actually lead to sort of overall changes in the way in which people act. And then uh, the interesting question sort of underlying that is, is professionalism a matter of sort of individual behavior or, or can it be regulated by institutions? You know, see, I come down on the side of sort of regulated by institutions, but that might be something that a lot of people find suspicious. So this is a story, it's about a decade-long story, and it's nice to have a relatively long professional career because you can follow these things along. So back in the early 2000s, the American Board of Internal Medicine was interested in pursuing a new project on professionalism, and, and Chris's predecessor, um, at the um, um, uh, ABIM, um, uh, Dr. Kimball asked me to sort of take this on, and uh, Chris, when she took over the uh, ABIM, was certainly a supporter, and we did a lot of casting about. We had a lot of different ideas, which met with a great deal of skepticism, but finally, we decided we'd write a charter, which is a word that the Europeans came up with, working with the American College of Physicians and the European Federation of Internal Medicine. The Europeans in particular were sort of saying, we need a series of sort of prin simple principles that we can outline that basically form the core of medical professionalism, and then we draw that out into some uh, reasonable conclusions that issue forth from the basic principles, and then we call that our charter, or you know, this is what we're going to sort of adhere to. So it was a, it was a good idea, but it was hard because we had about 15 people working on it, and finally we had to sort of uh, ensconce ourselves in a relatively sort of tawdry uh, beach uh, resort on the south coast of Spain for about six days in order to actually pull something together. Or, uh, we threatened we wouldn't let people leave. Um, and um, uh, we finally came up and finished it, and then it got published by The Lancet and the Annals of Internal Medicine. And when you do these kinds of things, because I've written a lot of papers that are about you know, here's an interesting idea about this or an interesting idea about that, but you find that, you know, basically it's fun to publish them, but nobody ever reads them and nothing ever happens. Uh, but over the course of the next three years, surprisingly really to us, um, and I think in large part due to some su su successful efforts at public relations, the charter was adopted by almost all the medical societies around the world, you know, internationally and in the United States, finally culminating in its being sort of accepted by the American Medical Association after, I think, you know, sort of about six or eight years of uh, studying it. Um, and, uh, but that was gratifying for those of us who were involved. Um, and it's relatively straightforward. Chris showed a slide uh, from the board. You know, it's basically three principles. You know, there's, there's the principle of patient welfare. So this is this sort of strong notion of altruism that runs through the most basic of medical ethics literature. 
uh, in the United States. This is basically the sort of night, trust me, we'll take care of you. And you get trusted, and as a result of earning that trust, you have to make sure you take care of people. The second part is patient autonomy. That is, patients are rights-bearing individuals, and their rights have to be respected. So uh, if um, uh, the first one's the knight's approach, the second one may be the knave's approach. The third one was the social justice uh, notion, which was important, really, for me at least, in terms of participating in this, and it was uh, to move things to sort of a more structural level and basically say that the physician as part of professionalism had a responsibility not only for the individual patient there, but also for the structure of health care and that there had to be a fair distribution of health care resources. And then naturally coming out of that, there were these sort of ten commitments and they made up the charter. So just the side of a couple, first a commitment to professional competence, that was really important to us because we were driving at this from the point of view of being members of the American Board of uh, Internal Medicine, improving the quality of care, not only sort of making sure that you were providing good care for your patients and you were there at sort of seven o'clock at night to take care of the patient, but also that you were doing things that could be measured and helping uh, develop those sorts of measurements so we could be sure quality of care was being rendered in a structural fashion. Uh, promotion of scientific knowledge, you know, going back to almost any definition of professionalism that you look at about how you're supposed to be sort of promoting scientific expertise. And, and management of conflicts of interest. So point about management of conflicts of interest, by 2004, 2005, there was increasing questions about whether these kinds of pronouncements could lead to real change. And so we went through the list, a different group now, uh, from the um, American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation to try to find a couple of the issues within this, in the charter that we could sort of bring to life. And after considering a several others, we focused on conflicts of interest. It was a good time to do it because basically right at that time, first of all, that's when Grassley first got awakened about various different conflicts of interest. And then there's also the massive litigation against the pharmaceutical manufacturers for uh, promotion of off-label um, uh, uses of medications that were seen as violations of the False Claims Act. Now two different, including last week another one, over $2 billion settlements on the part of um, uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So there was a lot of interesting things sort of coming together at the time in congressional hearings. So it was a good time to sort of focus on conflicts of interest. And we were mostly exercised about the pharmaceutical uh, firms and exactly how they uh, basically exerted influence within medical centers that basically sort of took conflict of interest. One interest is patient care. The other interest is promotion of uh, particular pharmaceuticals, and those things weren't always in alignment. So that's what we were really interested in. Anyway, uh, with a different group of people, equally sort of hard to write with, all very sort of um, opinionated people, um, uh, we wrote, you can see if you go back to JAM in February of 2006, the group that I was writing with, I love them all, but they're, they all are very difficult. Um, and, um, but the project was entitled A Policy Proposal for Academic Medical Centers. And basically, it was an outreach to medical schools and hospital systems to continue consider how to regulate the relationship with pharmaceutical manufacturers. And we went pretty far with this, I would say. This was not sort of a milquetoast set of recommendations. We basically said, ban gifting by pharmaceutical representatives, eliminate samples, eliminate pharmaceutical firm input on hospital formularies, uh, if there was going to be money for continuing medical education, give it to the dean, let the dean distribute it. Same thing for physician travel. If you're going to have the physicians travel, give it to a central office. You put a, a ban on speakers' bureaus. I don't know if it's an S or an X there, so I put both. Um, and, and ghost writing, you know, this notion that uh, we'll pay you to write an article or uh, we'll pay you to put your name on an article that we've written and have relatively sort of complete transparency. So it, was, it, it, it contrasts really quite nicely with, for instance, the IOM report, which looked at all these things three years later and then sort of diluted um, uh, each of them. And I think that was good because, you know, it really sort of set forth, you know, a very crisp set of recommendations. And the, the argument was really motivated by a couple of key empirical insights. And I always try to come back to the empirical, but within this, uh, George Lowenstein, an old friend of ours from uh, days in New Haven, <clears throat> and now at Carnegie Mellon, behavioral economist, um, uh, had done a series of very interesting experiments with students at Carnegie Mellon and then sort of extended them. But basically what he had sort of published was that there's no such thing as a small gift, all gifts matter. You know, so 
most docs would say that's ridiculous, but on the other hand, most pharmaceutical manufacturers don't waste money. They're smart, and they were constantly sort of giving out small gifts. So they thought small gifts mattered. And it turned out from George's research that a gift always creates debt. And then the other thing was the disclosure issue, that you can be trans uh, disclosure doesn't provide real transparency because most consumers just simply can't process it. And, and uh, having those two things, those were the sort of two key you know, sort of crutches that you relied on when you had a conflict of interest. I told you about it, and by the way, this money really doesn't matter to me. It's too small to matter to me. Um, uh, or these gifts don't matter. And so once you got rid of those things, it was really hard to sort of support most of the structure around the way in which, ph which pharmaceutical manufacturers interacted with medical centers. So, but the important point was, I think, from the from the sort of idea of sort of trying to deal with, you know, here at the University of Chicago, deal with the ideas or the difference in the ideas. We moved the discussion about professionalism from a matter of sort of individual discretion into a discussion about sort of structural integrity of the institution. So we weren't afraid to sort of say, we're taking this in some ways out of the hands of the individual doctor to decide. So one way you could deal with this would be to just say, Follow your own lights, okay? You're smart, you're ethical, you decide if you want to take the money from the pharmaceutical manufacturers. We said no, you know, the whole charter thing is about sort of structural as well as individual, and we ran this straight at the academic medical centers and said that, um, you know, an integrated system is, involves doctors and nurses and uh, other professionals, and they should be thinking in terms of how they're organized, how they're going to care for patients. And then also specifically at academic medical centers, because academic medical centers are responsible for training of future doctors and nurses and should take the lead in sort of developing these professional norms. And so uh, we basically put this as a challenge to the academic medical centers to accept the norms associated with these various bans uh, that we uh, had in place. Um, and the other important point underlying it that goes back to this sort of just distribution of resources, pharma marketing basically leads to unnecessary care, wasteful care. Talking to a friend of mine who's now working at um, Bristol Myers Squibber, one of the uh, drug companies, and you know about the third and fourth generation medications for diabetes. And his his plea to the researchers is, you know, just come up with something that's as good as metformin, for example. The, uh, a drug like Genuvia that Mer is a testament to Merck's ability to be able to market, because there's no professional guideline that would suggest that the number of patients who are on Genuvia today should be on that drug, and it's a very, very expensive drug. So uh, this spillover effect was cost without value, so it had an important point from the point of view of trying to make sure that resources were being used appropriately. So at first, we, I have to say, we went out and we talked to the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you know, join hands with us on this. This makes good sense. And we went and talked to them, and some of them, you know, they were nice, like the people at Merck, they were nice, you know, and, and thanked us, and gave us, handed us our hat. Uh, but, um, you know, a couple places you went to, the marketing person was sitting there, and mostly men, and the marketing guy, you know, said, at least on two occasions, you know, uh, it's all, he sat very quietly and said, it's all fine and good, but we own the doctors. So, you know, so it looked like, well, we weren't going to get anywhere with pharma, um, and um, uh, they predicted there would be no change in attitudes, really, and the reaction was largely negative, but then, a couple of um, medical schools began to sort of look at it and adopt it. And meanwhile, there was much more sort of litigation that was being brought by the federal government. And Grassley basically was investigating various different places. Harvard, where I used to work, for example, had some relatively sort of heinous examples, especially in the Department of Psychiatry, where you know people had been totally conflicted and had revealed none of that. And, and he was after that part of it. And then the medical students got involved. So the medical students were really in the vanguard. And one thing you can say about the medical students, they're always more idealistic. And it's a shame in some ways we sort of drive that out of them. Uh, but um, uh, they got right in the middle of it. The IOM was not. Um, uh, and several states began to pass laws around sort of transparency. And it looks like attitudes have begun to change somewhat. At least some places have begun to sort of adopt much more stringent approaches than um, uh, was the case in the past. And this is. You know, <clears throat> now, this is a study from, that looks uh, about from 2010. Uh, it's by Campbell and the group at Mass General. But what they show, look, comparing 2004 to 2009, there's been a decline in physician industry relationships. So we'd like to sort of see what this looks like today. It's interesting kind of empirical evidence that maybe there is a sort of shift in the way people are viewing these things, which would be exactly kind of what we had uh, intended. 
And the medical students, the American Medical Association, this thing that uh, these are called uh, jolly balls, I think of what those, that particular approach to uh, grading is called. But in any case, I put on there uh, University of um, uh, Pittsburgh Medical Center, Penn, I just took a sample, the Chicago Medical School, the University of Chicago Medical School, Cornell, and UConn to give you some sense about sort of how people are, are being graded. And I'm told uh, by the dean's office here that people take a lot of time and effort to make sure that they report appropriately to the um, American Medical Student Association so that these ratings uh, can kind of occur. And I personally don't think of you, I think of UPMC as a very business-oriented medical center. So, you know, I find it surprising that they are rated uh, uh, so highly. I can't understand why Cornell and, and uh, UConn uh, uh, a private and a public institution would be so low, but at least it gives you a sense that there is some measurement that's going on um, out there. Now, it's not making all that much difference. It's a little hard to read, just one more little empirical piece. You know, first of all, this is total payments to orthopedists, and what has happened is that the transparency laws, the, now the pharmaceutical manufacturers are basically saying, this is how much we paid people. So some enterprising orthopedists at the Brigham got that information and compared it to what was reported at the national meeting by the speakers. So you can see that in the, um, in the blue, that's the good. Those are self-reported people who are disclosing, including disclosing all the royalties they got. The yellow report that they um, uh, got some money, but they didn't include royalties in that. And then the uh, green, they didn't disclose their payments at all. So even though they were required to uh, by the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons. So two things about this. First of all, it suggests we've got a long ways to go because we've got you know, somewhere around a third of the people who are even not disclosing when they're supposed to disclose. The other thing is this kind of blows up the notion that these are small payments. You know, the, in, in, in fact, in many ways, when you do, if you did a sort of nice sociological study of orthopedic surgery, especially orthopedic surgery that involves implants, you would find that the implant manufacturers are sort of in control of the situation. No other way to explain why there's no registries in this country, uh, or, no, or, or at least no long-term registries um, of these kinds of uh, devices. So the, the empirical research that we want to do, because I always try to come back around to sort of something that's uh, measurable. We're doing something at CVS Caremark right now. Full disclosure. We make no money on brand medications. We make money on generic medications. So we're trying to push generic medications to the greatest extent possible. I'm proud of that because in most situations, generic medications are as good or better than the brand medications, and they lower costs overall for the healthcare system. But what we're interested in is sort of seeing whether or not stronger conflict of interest policies will lead, pharmaceutical, uh, will lead to less pharmaceutical company ma uh, marketing and hence the more better utilization of medications, including generic medications. So we take advantage of the AMPSA um, uh, 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 analyses to basically look at the strength of the conflict of interest policy at each of the individual medical centers. Those might not be very accurate or they may be inaccurate in places and things like that, but that just increases the noise in the, member, in the measurement and, and biases us towards the null in terms of the statistical analysis that will be done. And then we associate physicians to medical centers, and then we look at how the physicians are using the generic um, medications. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I'd hope to have this sort of data run, but we're just in the business, in the, in the process of sort of putting it together. So the data is still pending. But the, as part of the sort of end of the story, what it shows is that, you know, if you go back 10 years, you can sort of have a set of interesting ideas about sort of big picture professionalism and get kind of surprised that people are interested in that. And then you can choose a smaller area there, uh, conflicts of interest, um, and sort of try to reiterate what a new look at professionalism would say about how you handle those conflicts of interest. And then you can assess whether or not you're actually sort of making change um, uh, associated with that. So I think in many ways, as I said, it's a small story compared to the sort of big picture of the woes of our healthcare system. But it's an interesting story in terms of the sort of stresses and strains it shows around various different interpretations of professionalism. So I think my summary is what I just basically uh, stated. And um, you know, at some point or another, I hope they'll publish the empirical in investigation and see sort of exactly whether or not this specific uh, sort of uh, uh, effort to point at the academic medical centers has really made any difference. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Professor Paul Starr from Princeton. Professor Starr.
Well, thank you, Mark, uh, for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to uh, test out some new ideas. At least I, I hope they're new ideas. Professionalism is, uh, is an old subject. It's a subject that uh, I wrote a good deal about uh, some years ago. And without ever intending to give it up, I decided for a number of years to give it a rest in the hope that I could come back to it with uh, a fresh perspective. I've now written a, a new book um, that uh, some of you may have seen out there, uh, Remedy and Reaction, which is about the history of healthcare reform. That's not what I've come to talk about today. Um, the themes um, I want to develop today are, are different, um, but they are very much a reflection on, um, on where we are now as a society. Um, and, and, and how we might think about professionalism a bit differently uh, than at least some of us did in the past. Starting out with um, something more familiar, what, what are the distinctive assets of the professions? Well, I'd sum them up by saying um, knowledgeable, uh, a tr trustworthy knowledge and skill, with the emphasis uh, as much on the trustworthiness as on the knowledge and skill themselves. Information, after all, is not scarce or inaccessible in the age of the internet. Uh, in fact, we're overwhelmed by it. And when confronted with complex choices, uh, we often don't feel competent to find just the information that's appropriate to our situation or to sort through all the conflicting claims out there. Professionals answer that need. Though that's not the only reason that we turn to them. Uh, they stand at the doorway, so to speak, of courts and hospitals, insurance companies, and other institutions with decisive influence in our lives. So we have no choice but uh, to ask professionals to be our agents in entering and navigating those alien worlds. And so from a private standpoint, from uh, a layperson's standpoint, um, there isn't any doubt about the value of professionalism. Professionalism, however, is also a public resource, uh, a resource for all modern societies, but especially valuable for a liberal democracy and a peculiarly important resource for America today. That, that at least, is my thesis. Um, so I approach professionalism now from um, a somewhat different angle than in the past. Uh, I want to put professionalism um, in the context of uh, democratic theory, um, and to consider the role of the professions and professionalism in relation to the polity. There is a venerable democratic tradition of hostility to professionalism. Uh, that was the stance of uh, the Jacksonians in early 19th century America who abolished professional licensing laws. Uh, the same view has echoed through a long line of critics who've been suspicious like George Bernard Shaw, who said that every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. The, prof the professions are surely jealous guardians of their prerogatives. Professional and scientific communities are also certainly not democratic in the crude sense of believing that questions of scientific validity should be submitted to a majority vote. But a liberal democracy needs many other features besides a procedure for registering the will of the public. It needs methods for informing that will and for circumscribing and constraining it. Just as we individually need trustworthy knowledge applied to our personal situation, so a democracy needs trustworthy public knowledge. And if the voters are to hold uh, uh, their representatives accountable, they need uh, that information. Uh, a liberal democracy also needs mechanisms to correct errors and limit the damage from the characteristic democratic pathologies, such as excessive partisanship, uh, what our founders uh, thought of as the problem of faction. The 18th century concept of checks and balances emphasized the constitutional division of powers among branches of government. But to constrain the enlarged power of both the modern administrative state and the modern corporation, liberal societies have developed other methods of checking and balancing, of error correction and damage limitation, and professionalism is, and professionalism is part of that larger system. The professions have several features that enable them 
to create independent countervailing influence against both states and corporations. Professional and scientific communities extend across organizations and international borders, which makes them less subject to the arbitrary control of any single entity, governmental or private. And in addition, the, the norms of those communities generally call upon their members, in the way that that physician charter does, to maintain a sense of higher obligation than either profit or political advantage. To the extent that professionals look to their peers for recognition and reputation, they have incentives to take into account professional standards that their immediate employers may prefer them to ignore. And those standards, moreover, may become so deeply internalized through professional training and experience that they become a strong internal moral compass. To work well, a liberal democracy needs those forces to work within the state itself. We rely, for example, on the professionalism of the military, on the professionalism of public health officials, on the professionalism of social scientists who, for example, gather and analyze public data. We need their trustworthy knowledge and skill. Trustworthy, we hope, in part because of the standards imbued in their training and upheld through their professional associations. Professionalism within the government helps to maintain a boundary of the political. We expect professionals to provide competent skill that is independent of partisan bias and that limits how deeply politics penetrates into the everyday working of government. Professionalism within the corporation has some of the same features. It serves as a limit to how deeply pecuniary incentives penetrate into the work of the enterprise. A pharmaceutical company may want to get a drug approved for sale, but the scientists and physicians engaged in developing and testing that drug must nonetheless abide by the standards of their fields. It is their professionalism that primarily vouches for the trustworthiness of the data and the failure uh, uh, of that uh, 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 to, to, to maintain that trustworthiness is primarily their and the organization's disgrace. Of course, not all professionals live up to high standards when organizations cross-pressure them. But the standards are nonetheless a public resource, a basis in social norms for trying to improve the performance of both public and private organizations. Professionalism today has to contend not only with the pressures of politics and commerce, but also with the new environment created by digital technology and by the growing belief that technological innovation enables us to dispense entirely with expertise. Uh, there's no question that technology can empower consumers. With the use of new devices, uh, consumers can do many things for themselves individually that used to require the services of a physician, a lawyer, or an architect. And moreover, the internet has facilitated the rise of online communities that enable people to cooperate on a non-market basis in providing information, goods, and services. Wikipedia is a familiar case in point. In the online world, Credentials are often less important as a basis of intellectual claims than the willingness and ability to point to or disclose the data on, and do, or documents on which those claims are based. As one of the observers of the new media says, transparency is the new authority. But the belief in the expanding competence of individual consumers and lay communities can turn into a cult of the amateur. A good example is the response of some enthusiasts of new media to the shrinking number of professional journalists as the revenues of newspapers and other news media have declined. Since 2000, the number of editors and reporters at newsrooms in the United States has dropped from 56,000 to about 40,000, and various forms of reporting, such as reporting on state governments, uh, have diminished sharply. Well, some new media enthusiasts say, not to worry, citizen journalists will make up uh, for it. Um, but while blogs have proliferated, bloggers don't do much original reporting. And they typically lack professional training and editorial supervision. The internet has certainly given us more opinion. But it has not yet provided the economic basis for professionally reported news. These changes may be good for democracy in some ways, but very bad in others. Professionalism has uh, a public value, a public value that uh, I think has become more important in America today. The capacity to provide trustworthy knowledge 
has that special value, it seems to me, in a society that, however rich it may be in information, is low in trust. For decades, surveys have shown a decline in trust in American society in two different senses. First, Americans are less trusting of one another than they used to be several decades ago. There is less mutual trust. Trust, uh, for example, of a stranger who knocks on your door. Uh, and second, Americans have less trust in their institutions, both governmental and private. Suspicions of malevolent, of malevolent intent are just pervasive. Uh, ideological polarization has exacerbated the problem. Uh, and it isn't just electoral politics that's become polarized on ideological lines. It's evident in the news media as well. There's very little confidence in any neutral arbiters of fact. But unless different sides can establish some body of agreement about facts, the ordinary business of democracy becomes exceedingly difficult. And the scientifically based professions have not been immune from declining trust and confidence, but the erosion hasn't been as severe. Now these conditions, seems to me, ought to provide a new context for thinking about the professions, including medicine. They ought to tilt the balance back a bit from the direction that the social sciences took in thinking about the professions three or four decades ago. Let me talk now just a bit about the sociology of the professions, which, like so much of American thought, shifted from a celebratory to a critical view of its subject between the 1950s and more or less the 1970s. Initially, the dominant perspective, let us call it the standard model, viewed professionalization as functional and benign until a new generation recast it as the project of self-interested monopolists. The sociologist Harold Walensky succinctly summarized the standard model in 1964. Any occupation wishing to exercise professional authority must find a technical basis for it, assert an exclusive jurisdiction, link both skill and jurisdiction to standards of training, and convince the public that its services are uniquely trustworthy. As this formulation suggests, sociologists at that time particularly emphasized the following elements as requisites for a profession. One, a, a cognitive base, that is an area of technical specialized knowledge. And two, normative commitments to a service ideal, often formally expressed in a code of ethics, like that charter, and contrasted with commercial norms of the market. And third, uh, an exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, in support of their cognitive, normative, and jurisdictional claims, professionals have typically developed three interrelated institutions, professional schools, associations, and licensing and accreditation systems. And taken together, these allow for a high degree of collective self-regulation by a profession and instill in its practitioners a concern for the approval of colleagues, a peer orientation. Now, th those are the standard elements, and really, uh, they continue to be, I think, non-controversial among sociologists. Uh, the, but the problem with the standard model as it was developed, I think, in the 50s, lay in the tendency of some sociologists, such as Talcott Parsons, to take the self-conception of professions at face value and to view their ascendancy as a functional response by society to the growing complexity of knowledge. Just as Kenneth Arrow and other neoclassical economists saw professionalism and other aspects of medicine as rational welfare maximizing responses to uncertainty. The basic idea was that as knowledge becomes more complex, Society needs both to educate people to apply that knowledge and to trust the people it educates, and professionalism represents a solution to both of those problems. This view of the professions then came under attack in the 1960s as insufficiently critical of existing institutions, where the older generation saw a consensus about values and a commonality of interests between the professions and society at large. The new generation saw a deep conflict where the standard model accepted the profession's self-representation, the power approach uh, questioned their claims. According to this uh, perspective, uh, this monopoly power perspective, much of the profession's applied specialized knowledge was merely ideology, service, their service ethic was propaganda, and the mechanisms allegedly established for self-regulation 
were just ways of protecting the members of the guild rather than the public. From this standpoint, the profession's insistence that only those with professional credentials be allowed to engage in certain forms of practice reflected the interests of monopolists attempting to control a market. The view of the professions as monopolies of both knowledge and markets was the central point of uh, this alternative approach. And interestingly enough, this critique had support on both sides of the ideological spectrum. Some of the earliest economic work uh, critical of medical licensing laws came from Milton Friedman. And by the 1970s, other free market economists as well as legal scholars were arguing that medical care and other professional services ought to be subjected to the antitrust laws and stronger competition to break down the profession's monopoly power. Uh, meanwhile, drawing on the ideas of Marx and Weber, sociologists were arguing that the professions had used their monopoly power to dominate other occupations as well as consumers. And this story had a gender component. Uh, male doctors, feminists said, drove out fem female healers and controlled women in subordinate occupations. Although the intellectual traditions were different, the thrust, interestingly enough, in both economics and sociology aimed at shattering the aura of the professions and reducing the power that they exercised. Uh, in the book that I wrote in 1983, The Social Transformation of Medicine, uh, I was trying um, in part to synthesize uh, the standard model and the monopoly approach, as well as the work coming out of economics and law. My view was that the various perspectives on professionalism, though sometimes overdrawn, uh, give part of the picture. While the standard model was too benign and schematic, much of it wasn't wrong so much as incomplete. Professionalization does involve conflict and power, but the professions could never have succeeded in raising their status and income if they had not gained support from wider interests in society. But that achievement had to be understood as a political and cultural process rather than just simply a functional response to society's needs. I still don't take the functionalist view that society's needs determine how things develop historically. There is never any guarantee of a happy functional ending. My argument today is normative. Contemporary social and political conditions make the potential contribution of the professions more valuable than a half century ago when American society exhibited a far higher degree of consensus and mutual trust than it does now. At a time when society is divided and distrustful, the professions can serve an important res as an important resource for defending, important, for defending uh, critical values and reconstructing a sense of the common good. Now, let me try to bring this to bear on um, professionalism in healthcare. Um, I've suggested that professionalism can be uh, a public resource um, uh, uh, as a countervailing influence against some of the, pre of the pressures of commercialism and politics and technology. Uh, in healthcare, professionalism is not, of course, the peculiar property of physicians. It's part of the moral framework of all the health-related occupations that require extensive training. Medicine, however, occupies a strategic position in representing and interpreting the health sciences, not just to individuals, but to the wider public. And so physicians are justifiably a primary focus of discussion. The value of bringing trustworthy knowledge to bear on public debate can hardly be doubted at a time when ideological politics overflows into all manner of questions related to the human body, especially reproduction and sexuality, but also drug use, vaccines, um, uh, uh, cancer screening tests, so one could go on and on. But professional knowledge and judgment don't always command universal respect and deference when prominent political figures make uninformed statements on national television about the effects of a vaccine or distort the findings of researchers uh, on a cancer screening test. Uh, the politicians may have a real substantial uh, impact on public understanding, but it is just at those moments when the scientific community should hold its ground and insist on abiding by the evidence and when it can make, it seems to me, the most vital contribution. The medical profession is inevitably implicated in public controversies over health and health policy. In those controversies, the nation needs physicians to uphold standards uh, that may sometimes require them to concede, for example, that the practices they have followed are not, in fact, justified. Uh, the recent findings on 
uh, the, the prostate cancer screening test by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and the varying responses of different professional organizations are a relevant case in point. There, there is nothing more difficult than reversing established practices, but there's nothing more necessary uh, if we are to direct and control uh, healthcare spending uh, intelligently. Uh, if the sciences and professions uh, are to serve the purposes that I mentioned earlier of being an error correction and damage limitation mechanism, uh, they have to be willing uh, to be summoned to that work. Um, as professions often need to serve as a corrective and countervailing force in relation to politics, so they often need to do the same in relation to the marketplace. And I think that was really what um, Troy Brennan was talking about in that fascinating discussion. Uh, an increasing percentage of physicians work as employees of organizations, and many of those organizations are operated on a for-profit basis. While the organization's management has a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders, the physicians must have a fiduciary responsibility primarily to their patients, and those interests may sometimes conflict. And that's where it is crucial to defend professionalism within the corporation. Um, in the New York Review of Books a couple of weeks ago, Arnold Roman recently, uh, uh, Arnold Roman argued that uh, physicians can provide the solution to the rising costs uh, of health care and uh, and other um, ills that uh, beset the healthcare care system. Uh, Relman argues uh, for um, nonprofit, multi-specialty, uh, prepaid group practices, uh, uh, which uh, have long provided high-quality care at a lower cost than conventional fee-for-service medicine. Uh, he also argues that there is a trend uh, taking place now, um, a shift from uh, solo to group practice, and he argues that in time, um, that will provide the basis for a reformed healthcare care system, um, uh, uh, a basis for a system that's more cost efficient and professionally controlled. Uh, Relman offers that perspective in contrast to what he says in the article is, is the despairing view of healthcare care reform that I set out in my book, Remedy and Reaction. I don't think my view is altogether that despairing. It's just realistic. Uh, and though I share his belief that multi specialty group practice is a good thing, uh, I think we should be realistic about what the current trends um, portend. An increasing number of groups are being purchased by hospitals in order to capture more revenue, dominate their markets, and prepare for new kinds of insurance contracts and develop accountable care organizations. That's not necessarily a bad thing, though it could lead to greater local market power and higher costs, not greater efficiencies. In general, I would not count on developments of this kind to achieve the greater cost containment or lead to the receptivity to the kind of health reform that Dr. Roman prefers. But it is true that some group practice organizations have channeled professionalism in a more productive direction, and perhaps we can build on their efforts. Finally, what about the brave new world of digital innovation? So yesterday's New York Times op-ed page brought us a piece by Frank Moss, who I learned is the former director of MIT's Media Lab, and he tells us that new devices and software for consumers will render much of our current healthcare system superfluous. And let me quote from him. It would begin with a digital nervous system, inconspicuous um, wireless sensors worn on your body and placed in your home. Uh, that would continu continuously monitor your vital signs and track the daily activities that affect your health, counting the number of steps you take and the quantity and quality of food you eat. Wristbands would uh, measure your levels of arousal, attention, and anxiety. Bandages would monitor cuts for infection. Uh, your bathroom mirror would calculate your heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen levels. Then you'd get automated advice. Software that could analyze and visually represent this data would enable you to truly understand the impact of your behavior on your health and suggest changes to help prevent illness. Uh, and then I think trying to be diplomatic, Moss then says this would not make physicians entirely unnecessary. Many situations would still call for professional medical attention. But in most cases, you wouldn't need to make a costly trip to the doctor's office. If you were not feeling well, a lifelike avatar on your smartphone 
would use natural language processing to listen as you described your symptoms and then would translate them into medical jargon. And after consulting a diagnostic supercomputer, the avatar would ask you to run a few quick medical tests at home. <laughs> the thought of being continuously monitored uh, doesn't seem to me altogether reassuring. Um, think of all the possibilities of being momentarily alarmed by what appear to be dangerous signals and warnings from your mirror <laughs> or your wristband. Uh, the instant availability of online information about symptoms of diseases is already uh, said to have caused an outbreak of a new condition, cyberchondria. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you've suffered it from your, uh, your, you, yourself as you've checked to see what your symptoms might mean. <clears throat> Years ago, uh, the New Yorker had a cartoon of two elderly women sitting and talking and one of them is motioning to a photo, uh, which is apparently the photo of her late husband. And she's saying, no, he didn't really die of anything in particular. He was a hypochondriac. <laughs> if Frank Moss is right, and we're all soon wired up and continually on edge about the status of our various bodily organs, <clears throat> we may well kill ourselves through a technologically advanced form of hypochondria. But I don't want to seem entirely negative about these possibilities. I am sure that I will come to revere my avatar as much as I do my doctor. But reducing the role of physician to the strictly cognitive functions is, is missing something. Uh, not just the emotional context, but also the moral dimension of medical practice. And it's missing the element I've tried to highlight this afternoon. The professions can serve a public purpose by upholding the values integral to professional work and representing those values in both their relations with patients and with the polity at large. Um, technology can do a great deal for us. I, it can't do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor Starr is not going to be happy to learn because the New York Times didn't say it that Frank Moss sits on the Princeton board. <laughs> and uh, I know Frank pretty well. Uh, our, our final speaker in today's panel is Professor Richard Epstein. Uh, Professor Epstein will speak on will the deprofessionalization of medicine improve quality of care? Richard. Well, I come here with a certain degree of advocate of apprehension. I looked at the faculty program. I see Dr. Rubenstein, Dr. Castle, Dr. Brennan, Professor Starr, and I'm missing. So I assume that there's something that you did either on purpose or by accident for Mark, but it is true. Um, but I'm going to try to redeem that by speaking about the subject uh, in a way that I hope shows that I'm indeed not a doctor. I hope to prove that quite conclusively. I'm going to come to this as a lawyer and to some extent as an economist, an industrial organization economist. I'm going to agree with the odds and ends that have been set here, but try to take a fundamentally different approach, which is captured in the idea about the deprofessionalization of medicine, which to some extent I regard not as an unpleasant prospect, but perhaps as some kind of a necessary one. In order to explain why it is I think that this is the case, I think it's very important when you start to think about this situation to understand the sort of general tendencies that professions have. And as Paul Starr said quite rightly, they are always conflicted by two particular goals. On the one hand, they always have a certain level of aspiration and professionalism, knowledge and expertise. On the other hand, they always have a desire to act in restraint of trade. And it turns out that the correct analysis on this particular point is to recognize that both of these points are true. Even if you want it to be the world's perfect monopolist, as many people try to aspire, there is no way that you can be a monopolist unless you have a product that is worth providing to the public at large so that the good monopolist constantly works to improve the efficiency of the operation and also to batten down the hatches so that new forms of businesses cannot come in. And in fact, when I listen to some of the uh, discussions, you can see very strong elements of the monopolist kind of situation here. Let me briefly comment on, for example, what Troy Brennan talked about in the experiment with respect to conflicts of interest. I should say for the record that I wrote something 
quite critical about this particular proposal in multiple places, including in our uh, Biological Perspectives magazine here. And let me just tell you what I think the source of the uneasiness is on my part, which is when I see a professional organization trying to set standards with respect to all private institutions, the one question that I ask is whether or not this is in fact a violation of the antitrust laws on the grounds that when you start setting standards with respect to all organizations, it amounts to a collective refusal to deal, and that turns out to be a per se violation under the antitrust laws. I don't regard this as a joke. I think it's a very serious kind of problem that you have to have, and this is even if I happen to agree with some of the recommendations that turn out to be proposed. And the question is, why is it that one would do this? It's because my own view about these things is that the only way that you get knowledge over which particular systems are going to work and which particular systems are not going to work is to be able to have some form of open entry into the market. And when you start having trade associations pushing very hard in one particular direction, other people with other models may in fact now find themselves very reluctant to sort of express that, and everybody may go along with it. In dealing with this, it's also very difficult to know what the correct output measures are. There's no question that you could track a decline in physician and pharmaceutical company influence over the way in medical centers operate. It's not at all clear that you can show that this is a good thing because the dissemination of information can take place in many ways. And one of the possibilities is you allow all of these people to come in. You try to set up various kinds of theaters in which they go on a panel, so six guys selling different, six different kinds of statements each try to say their case, and you have everybody in the room talking about it. And in my own view, I would rather have, in many cases, information provided by multiple sources, which you could try against, rather than trying to keep everybody out altogether. And so, for example, when you have the kinds of recommendations that have been made, that form of innovation, which might work, uh, should be tried. Now, it might fail. But in fact, if you have uniform leading hospitals taking one kind of position or medical centers, you're not going to get the kind of experimentation. So my view about it is that competition not only is efficient from the traditional economic sense, but in a world of high levels of information uncertainty, it acts as a discovery message method whereby you could figure out what's going on and how things ought to be done. Now, I have exactly the same view with respect to the way in which we think about the healthcare. I can think of no people who are more representative of the establishment of medicine than Chris Castle and Arthur Rubenstein. And I think we all are very grateful for the wonderful work that they've done. But they look at the profession from the inside, I look at it from the outside, and we have a complete difference about the approach to the particular subject, which is captured by the other part of my talk, namely the issue having to do with the, pre the deprofessionalization of medical care. And let me see if I can explain what goes on. Uh, to me, the single most important question about the failure of American medicine is why are there not new voices showing up? So the Troy Brennan I want to put on stage is the guy who runs the CBC Care Mart and starts to set up these clinics where you can get a reliable visit for $25 um, without having to have an important appointment and waiting in a particular room. And the key feature about this is it's a form of deprofessionalization because now what you do is you take people who are not familiar with the traditional medical hierarchy and what they try to do is to radically reconstruct the provision of health care in a way that is going to be necessarily consumer driven. Now what are the kinds of things that that entails and then why might it turn out that it actually makes sense? Well, the first thing what it does is it recognizes that individual professional judgment is an enormously expensive thing to exercise. And it turns out that even the best physicians relying on their own intuitive judgments will have very high error rates of both type 1 and type 2. So what you try to do when you put the system together is to get somebody, an HMO, a care mark provider of one form or another, which can take large amounts of data so as to be able to develop protocols which can handle the question of how it is that you sort individuals when they present for treatment in the first time. And I don't even remember all the details, but I gather there were some folks at Cook County Hospital trying to figure out the way in which you start to sort patients uh, when they come in and you don't know whether they do or do not have a form of cardiac arrest, whether you should or should not keep them. And what they did is they developed a three-step protocol, three protocol, which turned out to be cheaper to apply by a rank amateur uh, than any of the most sophisticated techniques supplied by doctors. And it was better with respect to both dimensions. That is, it had lower levels of false admissions to the hospitals and lower levels of exclusion. 
Now, to the extent that that information is reliable, and I'm not going to verify the reliability of the information, but just simply make the conditional proposition, then we want to do is to find ways in which we can deprofessionalize medicine by professionalizing another segment of the market, those people who are really good at information technology, who can take lots of reports from lots of companies and lots of patients, and then try to put together the generalizations, which will in turn allow the protocol, which then will allow for the sorting of patients at the time that they arrive. And if it turns out that this particular method involves professionalization by individuals who are not doctors, in effect it has a second version of a great advantage, which is again uh, simply ignored, I think, when you start to talk about the way in which the dominance of the medical model takes place. If you look at any other industry when they centralize information, what they're always trying to do is to find a way to take those people who operate at the periphery and sort of reduce them to lower skill levels than the people whom they used to have. So if you go to the banking industry, what happens is you take a standard metric, much like you would do in medicine, of a number of inputs which give you something like a credit score, and then what would happen is you'd put it inside a computer, and they would spit back the price or the interest rates that are going to be charged for certain kinds of loans and so forth. So if you buy a car today, nobody interviews you, nobody sees whether you have calluses on your hand as evidence that you work hard. The entire process goes out to competitive bid, and the return, since everybody's talking to computers, essentially is given back to you within 15 seconds, 30 seconds, or a minute, and there's nobody else there. What this does, in effect, is it means that you don't have to hire layers of people who are expert in credit finance and so forth to compute things, because what you did is you hired a relatively few number of people with very powerful algorithms, and they're the ones who essentially ran the show. And the folks at the outer levels had less discretion, therefore commanded lower wages, and therefore allowed you to disseminate the services into the market at a lower price than would otherwise take place. When it comes to medicine, exactly the same kind of thing can take place. There is nothing which says that medical, or to be slightly different about it, healthcare services have to be provided by healthcare professionals. What you always are trying to look for is whether or not you can find a way so that routine services can be tied by other sorts of people, nurses, nurse practitioners, aides of one sort or another. And the task of a very sophisticated system of management is to try to figure out when you start to do all of this stuff exactly how you match the people with the particular problem. Uh, one of the things that you understand is that in every business known to man, the single most dangerous point are always those of transition. If you think, for example, of something like Joe Paterno, that's a transition problem. You didn't get the right information to the right people at the right time, and you have a natural disaster on your head. When you sort patients, if you don't get the right patient to the right doctor at the right time, if that's what's needed, you're again going to have exactly that kind of situation. But you have to remember there are always two kinds of errors when you're working with these things, because it is not an efficient solution to have a lot of situations where you refer, refer patients who are in relatively good health to physicians when, in fact, nothing is needed of the sort. And it's disastrous to run it in the opposite direction as well. So the protocol essentially becomes the standard technique, and it will allow you essentially to decide a set of institutional systems in which the ratio of doctors on the one hand to other kinds of healthcare professionals can shift in a way which can drive the cost curves down in a way that no reorganization associated with the standard provision of medicine can possibly do. The second lesson that you start learning about this is that you despair to use the old Chicago maxim, that's the law school economics maxim, of whether or not it is that one size fits all. And here I want to be agnostic rather than dogmatic. If one starts to listen to the standard rhetoric, there is abundant evidence, most of which I would accept, which says that there are high levels of inefficiency that are associated with fee-for-service medicine. And it also turns out that I think that if you're trying to figure out, once you get within a healthcare system, uh, that what Chris Castle said is probably correct, that a cooperative model will beat authoritarian models every time, in which you get team engagement with respect to it. In fact, anybody who's ever worked in medicine in any other field in the world would be astonished that it took doctors so long to realize what is management A, B, and C, and every other business that I've been encountered in my life turns out to be an alien conception when you start to come to medicine. If you don't know how to build morale, how to get team production and all the rest of that, then in effect you are a failure as a manager, and if you can't make widgets with this kind of obsolete philosophy, there's no way that you're going to be able to take care of health care as well. 
Okay, that's the general point, but the question is whether or not when we start having general preferences, it turns out that they should become universal imperatives. And the lesson that you learn if you do industrial economics or do the law of it is that any time you try to universalize a good idea, it becomes a bad idea. Uh, the fundamental notion in all of these situations is that populations have distributions. The heterogeneous. You don't even know at the outset whether you're looking at a normal distribution. If it is normal, exactly what the skew and the variance is. You don't know whether or not you're going to have an asymmetrical distribution. You don't know whether you're going to have a discontinuous distribution and so forth. But what happens is unless until you know all of those particular variables, you cannot be sure exactly the way in which a particular firm ought to operate. There are in every business scale effects, there are key questions, for example, as to whether or not you could have one firm with multiple locations, or whether it's going to be more efficient to have two separate firms. These are very hard questions to answer. They cannot be answered in the abstract. And the danger of having this sort of model that Kaiser Permanente rules the world is, in effect, that it is not responsive to the way in which various kinds of outlying communities ought to respond. And it tries to use central government, which doesn't have interest or knowledge of the fine variations that take place with various sorts of institutions to make the effective differentiation. To put this in a somewhat more economic or philosophical term, one of the great 20th century philosophers, uh, economist, he was a little bit of both, a man named Friedrich Hayek, and if you tried to figure out what his central contribution was to the theory of knowledge and how it applies to healthcare, you would put the thing as follows. What you'd say is that Hayek understood that the purpose of a price system, the perfect of a market, was to communicate information about prices and about the relative value and cost of services that no one person could hope to have over his head. And so his major opponent was, in fact, central planning, where the thought was that you can get through one particular person all the data and then essentially have whatever distribution of wealth you want because you knew exactly what quantities to produce and how to supply them. You note that there's a kind of a tension, because what I said is that when you're talking about firms, what you actually are looking for is the kind of centralization, which our friend Hayek despaired of when you started to talk about trying to control economies. But the key difference of this is when you're dealing with a government, you've committed yourself to a scale effect. You're trying to run this for the United States, and frankly, you're going to fail. Whereas in the standard market model that I'm talking about, uh, there's no restriction on entity of new firms, such that if one firm becomes too big or one firm has a database which is suspect, there's always a way for a competitor to come in there. So you will have competing firms, and you will get decentralization at the firm level, even though you may not get it at the doctor level. And so once you get this kind of decentralization, what will happen is people will be able to perceive and take advantage of local knowledge, and that will start to lead to a kind of variation within the set of firms. What will then happen when you start to do all of this? Well, you get a little bit more humble. It may well be that with certain kinds of super specialties, that fee-for-service will still remain the optimal form of health care, notwithstanding the fact that it may be that group care will be very important. And it may well be, and I think this is already is taking place with respect to the Medicare population, that people will have two physicians instead of one. They'll have a Medicare physician for standard services, and they will go to some elite physician, if they can afford it, who will provide them with a different set of services on diagnosis or whatever else it is that they want, which in fact is more consistent with the kinds of money that they pay or the medical <coughs> they can afford to pay or the medical conditions that they start to have. And once you start to see these kinds of things, what you want to do is to be very cautious about starting to talk about a kind of a universalization of any model, one as against all the others. Now, there's another way in which I think I could make the same point. Uh, there was a discussion during the earlier session about the question of whether we want global capitation fees or whether we want some other system of payment. And the basic proposition that you have to make, if you're doing this as a kind of an economist lawyer, is that there is no system which is first best optimal. And what one means by that is that no matter how it is that you decide to organize and to price the services, there will always be some kinds of conflict of interest. In the legal and economic field, we call this agency cost. And what we mean, in effect, is that the returns to the principal and the returns to the agent will vary in some key respect such that there will be a situation in which an agent will, in fact, find it in his or her interest to do something which works against the interests of the firm. How much more time? Okay. 
five women. Well, that turns out to be an endemic problem to all sorts of businesses. What you have to understand is you can never drive that particular problem down to zero. What you can do is you can substitute monitoring costs of one kind or another to control for it. And indeed, one of the really strong and I think consistent criticism of Medicare is that it spends too little on monitoring relative to private health care plans, and so that you get much more waste, fraud, and abuse than you might on the others. And when Tom Phillipson presented here last spring, he showed that if you looked at the data, the Wenberg data in particular, based on public Medicare stuff, it showed far higher variations in cost and price and penetration than it did for the same regions when you started to look to private firms, which essentially are capable of supplying more uniform standards of oversight in medicine, in medicine than the others. So what you can't do, therefore, is to say we solve the problem with the cap, or we solve the problem where, in fact, we do the Medicare billing. You do not know a priori. Um, we heard a lot of ridicule, which I fully share, that if you look at the way in which the Medicare system is trying to solve this problem, their attitude today is to slice the salami even thinner than it's previously done and to create multiple classifications, none of which make sense, all of which lead to essentially an antecedent question which creates the kind of upbilling which everybody fears and mentions in the group. What it turns out is you're going to really have to think and no government agency knows how to think about it, to fundamentally repackage health care services. And this is going to conclude, for example, the further question of how it is that you integrate non-visits in the way in which you actually price for health care services. Can you find a way in which you could have patients use, for example, scans that come on a video screen, or in fact just email their doctors with some kind of information so as to save the cost of transportation, the wait in the rating room, the potential of getting sick when you go outside, and all these other things. And, you know, Paul Starr is 100% right when he says, you know, that fantasy land won't arrive tomorrow. But good markets don't work by fantasies. What they tried to do is to figure out gaps in the information technology, gaps in the pricing structures, and then take incremental steps, see whether they work, and then when they move, do others. One of the great failings of a government program about this is they are not systematic incrementalists, so they don't get marginal information and use it correctly. And so, for example, when you start talking about do we or do we not have electronic records, the idea sort of is, well, we want electronic records. The entire team starts to move towards electronic records, and you spend billions of dollars putting in systems that don't talk to one another, that come too quickly, and that, in fact, are probably going to be obsolete in a very short period of time. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you're trying to actually figure out how you run a system of medicine, it's too important to be left to doctors. Um, frankly, I teach in Mark's clinical medical ethics class, and I've come to believe very passionately in the division of labor. Um, when it comes to the question of what kind of cut you make in order to remove a spleen, I will yield to anybody in this room. But when it comes to figuring out how you organize business and payment structures, I think doctors have no comparative advantage in that. I think I know something about it because I've done it so many years in so many different industries. And even I would be enormously hesitant to start to say, this is the right way to do it. The only way you can do it is through collaborative efforts. But you will never have collaborative efforts of the sort that you want if you put on the blackboard a chart which says the advantage in leadership all lies with respect to medicine. And we can have all three things that we want, access, quality of care, and all the rest of this stuff simultaneously. You cannot do that. Uh, you have to throw in a budget constraint. You have to figure out the way this works. And so let me just end on one note, which is if you're trying to figure out what the most conspicuous change is with respect to the provision of health care today, the answer is it's the rise of government regulation at all parts and at all sectors of the economy. And the only way in which you can improve quality, improve access, and lower price is at the government level to figure out how it is that you can engage in some level of deregulation. What the deregulation will do is lower cost if you get it right. Once it lowers cost, it will increase access. Once there are market pressures created through intermediaries like CBC and other places, you can increase the quality of the care, and you might be able to reverse the cycle. But what I fear is that everything I heard in the first session at lunch reminds me of Russian standard central planning by benevolent people circa 1950. And that is not going to work. Thank you. Bob Orr from Loma Linda University. 
at the risk of being labeled a dinosaur, I'd like to address a question to Professor Starr, but I'd be interested in the other responders as well. In your encapsulation of professionalism as um, trustworthy knowledge and skill, you did not include two components that I thought have been classically associated with professionalism, altruism and self-policing. I wonder, do you think those are still important components? Say yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, when I elaborated uh, the analysis of professionalism later, uh, I did include those elements. But I was trying at the beginning to distill what I thought was the central element. And I think those things that you point to, the self-policing and altruism and so forth, that is um, in support of the trustworthiness. Uh, but um, uh, if you want to, you know, boil it down, to me, uh, trustworthy knowledge is a, is, a, is a good summary of what the distinctive asset is, the distinctive claim of the professions. Um, on the altruism point, it's interesting. There's a famous paper by um, Reuben Kessel about 1958 talking about how it is that the medical profession becomes cartilized. And I remember at one of the workshops when he came back in the early 70s, we asked him the question, these guys are cartilists, why would they ever supply anything below marginal cost? Particularly, why would they give anything away for zero? And it turns out that he had a bunch of basically crazy explanations. And the only explanation that works is that even in a cartilized industry, when you have altruism, you will find for a variety of individual motives that people will give away the stuff for zero price. When you look at self-interest or self-policing, it's a somewhat different variable. Self-policing is what good physicians do on an honorable basis, but it's also what cartels do to make sure that people don't chisel against the price. <laughs> so that what you do is you have this peculiar dichotomy uh, that at the same time, you guys are running cartels and you're giving away things for free. And I think that actually captures the joint interaction between the sort of the ethical side of the medical business and the professional side. So it's a slightly more complicated model of individual self-interest, but I think it's actually a more, more accurate one. Uh, a real case, radiologists in my institution have to increase their, uh, the MRIs and the, the exams they, they have to, uh, to look at for, for about 10%. They have no more resources, no more money, and, and basically the reaction of many was, yes, but if I miss a diagnosis or the evolution of cancer, I cannot live with that. And somebody said, you know, one out of 200, it's not a big deal, or one out of 500, we can deal with that. So for professionals, they have to deal with real persons, and they care about individuals. But when you look at the same thing, uh, as a market or for large numbers, you miss one diagnosis, one out of 1,000. You can deal with that. I, I would like to hear. Uh, yeah, I'll give you an answer because I think what you're trying to do is, is, is to make scarcity disappear. That is, if you actually run a particular system and you have finite resources at any level, you will have error costs in both directions. So if you say that you can't live with error, that what you're saying is I demand an infinite budget, and frankly, we're not going to give you or anybody else that. Well, what you need to do, in effect, is to try to run the system so that you get the right protocols to minimize the two types of error. And if you could lower cost, you get another virtue, which you're missing when you look at it slowly from the bench. Namely, you hope to be able to take more people into the system in an earlier stage so that what happens is it may well be that you make two errors, but if you bring in another 100 people, you may prevent five more cancers out of this situation, so that's what you want. And indeed, one of the serious problems of the, can of the Canadian system is that its initial intake on virtually all things like mammograms and pap smears is markedly lower by a significant level than what it is in the United States today because of their budget constraint. So again, what you got to do is you sit down and you tell that concern, and that should lead you to trying to do it the other way. And if you really care about the patients, one of the things that you try to figure out a way is to automate the diagnosis, outsource them to India, all sorts of other things, because the only way you will get greater market penetration is through lower price. Thank you. I have a question for Paul Starr and maybe a little bit for um, Troy. Um, so that uh, so Professor Starr made a case for kind of professionalism as a countervailing force in some ways against 
the abuses of market forces as well as um, other kinds of rampant democracy, I think, or was what you were talking about, or, or the, the <coughs> impact of the media on misinformation and the way it gets um, uh, transmitted. And part of what my case, which I think Richard was mischaracterizing in a way, is that the, ten the complexity of medical care and the drive for lower costs is leading to more innovation in how groups come together and there's something about the group, not so much how they're paid, but the fact that it's a group that leads to better performance, and that comes from industrial theory. So, you know, Troy's involved in this particular kind of innovation as well that involves non-physicians working with physicians, ph pharmacists, and a whole group of people. My question for you is, is there such a thing as group professionalism? Is that, have you thought about that in your new <coughs> look at this? Because we tend to sort of think, well, you know, the um, doctors have their code, and the nurses have their code, and the fire. But I wonder if people are thinking about standards for groups in this in this uh -huh. environment. Uh -huh. Well, uh, you know, generally, one of the one of the characteristics of professional work is uh, is a peer orientation, a collegial orientation. That doesn't necessarily mean within a single formal organization, but uh, collegiality and professionalism are congruent ideas. So there's nothing incompatible about that, but it is certainly true from the historical perspective in American medicine where there was this long tradition, still to some extent is this tradition of independent solo practice, that, that there seems to be some conflict. But really think about, about many other professions that, that work in groups and have, have all, you know, there, so I, I, don't think, I don't think there's any inherent conflict at all. Okay, okay I'm making a couple of observations about this. I, want, I, I don't think I mischaracterized you because I don't even think I disagreed with you in the way you think I did. What I said was I thought that what you described was in fact the dominant credible business model, but that you have to be careful about trying to generalize from a dominant model to an exclusive model given the way in which the factors of production interact. And so it doesn't seem to me to be remotely plausible that all physician services are best supplied through the Kaiser right. market. No, I, all, I'm not talking about the Kaiser model. Yeah. There are many different... Yeah, and any other one. But CBS the point, is a very different... As I understand. Model. Was, right. But that's the point, is that the, I think what you're talking about in terms of the culture inside an organization is generally, when, when you do business, the first thing you teach students is about morale and culture, and everything else is in second right. place. But they could be very different organizations. I want to comment something about the public pressure, because this is something on which, you know, Marsha Angel actually wrote the right study. And I don't mean her book on the pharmaceuticals, about which the less said the better. Uh, but the earlier book that she did on, with the physicians on trial, you start to show the pressure that is put upon physicians to basically doctor their findings in order to satisfy the requirements associated with the mass tort litigation that takes in the United States. And this has happened not only in the cases that she documented with the breast cancer implants, but if you go and you look at the Senate hearings on the lead levels associated with danger and so forth, they're just incredible pressures that are put on there. Indeed, it has gotten so bad in the United States in many areas that even when cases get up to the Supreme Court, people stop lobbying, start lobbying the Justice Department and the Solicitor General to get them to weigh in on the case, even to reverse findings that have been taken below by professional administrative agencies. If I had to say it, the single most disappointing feature of public life is when I entered the legal profession in 1968, you know, I wasn't very high in it, but you knew that professional staffs at Treasury and the FDA were largely immune to these kinds of pressures. And I think the size of the stakes in the current situation have transformed that situation mightily and have created an immense amount of distrust which you cannot cure unless you have a firmer system of property rights um, in terms of the way that government doesn't have the kind of discretion that it currently has. And I think that's something inside the American medical profession you have to really worry about because the erosion is going to take place. You sue doctors, you start suing pharmaceutical manufacturers. It's amazing what happens in the transformations to the FDA and other organizations that have to worry about monitoring and policing these things. Thank you, Pat. Um, I have a question kind of uh, for Dr. Epstein. Um, when looking at sort of a, an increasingly market-based approach to healthcare, um, I wonder if there's fundamental disagreement among the different parties involved as to what the actual product is. And when I see people look at this from the, the political or the public health spectrum, people look at this abstract concept of societal health. Yeah. And physicians seem to concern themselves with uh, the relief of the burden of uh, 
the problems inherent sort of in, in the human body. And that the, the populace is looking at something that may be sort of a true commodity, which is both viewed as getting better day by day, although it's probably never been as good as people think it is, and one that the more they get, um, the better. And so how a increasingly market approach, which may very well be more efficient at distributing the dollars around, is going to be effective until we can really decide what it is that healthcare is supposed to be as a collective. We do that. We don't want to be distributing dollars around. That gets a lot of costs for very little benefit. One of the ways in which I try to put the point is it's important for doctors to encourage the commodification of medicine. Um, and, and what I mean by that is not that I want bad care. It's that if you look at the really successful complex systems dealing, for example, with the transfer of money and so forth, you can do that in relatively automated ways. To the extent that you could introduce, although it would be harder, those things, you reduce the cost function, and that simply takes the pressure off of everything else. But it will not eliminate all conflicts of interest. Basically what happens is uh, the two-step story of why medicine is in such difficulty is you start with fee-for-services, then it turns out these become very costly. Patients can't pay because of the stochastic nature of the obligations upon them. What you then do is you introduce the insurance companies. At the beginning, they just sign checks, and then they realize that the patient and the physician will alter for the increased level of medical care given the fact that there's outside payment. And then the outside organization insists upon putting some controls on it, but there's no dominant solution about the way in which the controls work. And, and I think the only thing that you could say about a market is that that tripartite conflict between the physician and his or her autonomy, the patient and the level of care, and the overall budget paid to the HMO is something which can only be resolved by negotiation. There's no outside situation. The name of the game, I mean, one of the real disservices, put it another way, that Milton Friedman tended to give in doing market economics is that you assume that markets always cleared and there was never any high level of error coming out of the system. That's true when you're selling baked beans in cans, that you get 99.999% quality control. It's not true with medicine, and you have to lower your expectations, and if you do that, you may actually be able to raise your performance. Is how central do you think the conflict of interest problem is in the decline of confidence and trust in the profession? I mean, is, is, it, is it close to the fundamental problem, or is it just one of, of a number? I don't know. I mean, you know, I think, first of all, how much of a decline has there been in the trust of the profession? I'm not certain, you know, sort of empirically that that's a correct statement. And then secondly, I don't think it looks good um, uh, from a variety of points of view uh, when you have physicians who appear to be sort of making decisions um, that are based on their affiliations and payment that they receive from the pharmaceutical firms. I think it is interesting, you know, we use, uh, and certainly in my business, we use a restraint of trade a lot in terms of a lens for analysis. And use what? Restraint of trade. I mean, because um, there is no such thing as a group uh, professionalism that Chris was asking about. The doctors would very much like to sort of keep the nurse practitioners from making any inroads in terms of the treatment that's available. On the other hand, I don't see it restraint of trade when a professional organization like uh, the American Diabetes Association gets 10 experts together and they say, here's a practice guideline for taking care of diabetics. Um, that excludes expensive and unnecessary medications. I don't see that as a restraint of trade um, against the manufacturers of those, of those medications. So somewhere in between, you know, there's an interesting area, but it's not when you're sort of trying to define practice guidelines and referring to that as an antitrust problem. Yeah, but the antitrust law is not what you say it is. It is certainly the case where you're drawing ex naked exclusions are always actionable. But when you're talking about the recommendation and non-recommendation of treatment, the correct legal position today is it's a rule of reason inquiry in which the professionalism counts as a slight plus for the defendants against the suit. But you're not getting summary judgment on that case. Um, well, well, you could make it out as a per se violation. Well, I, I don't, I'm not trying. I think, in effect, it's not a per se violation. Well, I think, it, but you can make it out in that regard. But I think anybody who will argue that would think it's ridiculous. But that, that's why I'm not doing it. I'm arguing a rule of reason. I, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I and do I mean, take absurd rule, positions, get, but not once gratuitously. Once you get to a rule of reason, it's going to, you know, you're, no one would be able to make an actionable claim in that regard. I think it is interesting to sort of think about sort of a university of Chicago decides to say that its faculty can 
no longer have um, uh, participate in speakers bureaus, that's a more interesting question from a sort of rule of reason analysis for me. But when you say there's a practice guideline that says, you know, this is how we take care of diabetics, I don't think anyone makes that argument. Um, well, the difference is the diabetic situation is cross firm. The University of Chicago is only on the individual firm. And unless the university has market power, there's no antitrust violation no matter what it says. So again, that's not quite right on I'll the law. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, honest. This, that for once, it's actually something I do teach. <laughs> yeah. Bill I, Ellis. I, I, I Bill thought you Ellis, taught everything. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Bill Ellis, uh, University of Texas. This is a question really uh, for you, Dr. Brennan, but I'm sure uh, I would like to hear from uh, uh, both uh, Paul Starr and Richard Epstein. I'm sh I expect I will. But the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first of all, Dr. Brennan, I, you'll be glad to know that I am a very, very uh, satisfied customer of uh, CVS, so uh, <laughs> you serve me very well. Uh, my question is a, a larger question about uh, the role of pharmaceutical companies, not only in the academic area and so on, and I'm not saying anything about uh, your company at all because of the comments I'm going to make, I've never seen your company doing. But a number of other pharmaceutical companies do uh, an enormous amount of advertising. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I don't like to watch TV because I get sick. Uh, you could have this, you could have that, and all these sorts of things. So I, I wonder whether you could talk about the dynamics of, uh, really my bottom line question, is the, the making of profit in pharmaceuticals and the ethical or unethical ways of making that profit. You need to make a profit, and I'm all in favor of that, but I wonder if you could comment on some of those things. Well, we're not a pharmaceutical firm. Basically, you know, what we do is distribute through the retail pharmacies and then do pharmacy benefit management. And our big job is to reduce the amount of profit that the pharmaceutical manufacturers make, especially on the pharmacy benefit management side. That's where we make profit, by reducing the amount of profit that they make. But in terms of sort of the things that they're doing, both with regard to sort of what would be considered commercial free speech, which I know Richard's going to want to get in on, um, as well as um, uh, their efforts to sort of um, uh, make as large a profit as possible. I think that's perfectly reasonable from the point of view of sort of a market. They're in the market, that's what they should be doing, that's their fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. So I don't have a problem with that, but that doesn't mean we don't spend a lot of time trying to cook up ways to overcome uh, influences that they derive from direct-to-consumer marketing, for example. Thank you. Um, look, uh, I think the best way to do this is, is not to start with pharmaceuticals as though it's some distinctive industries, but just to ask why any firm advertises in any market, whether they're competitive or monopolistic. And, you know, it's obviously to gain market share, but people often forget that many drugs, many industries, particularly drugs, have high fixed, low marginal costs with respect to their products. And if you can expand the base by advertising, what you can then do is divide the fixed cost, which for a drug, a new one, could be over a billion dollars today, among a larger class of users, so that what happens is, as the advertisement costs go up, the total cost to the customers start to go down, which essentially is a social benefit. Then the next question is, can you find places where an individual firm acting on its own creates advertisements that generate conflicts of interest with social welfare? And that's a very hard case to make out under the antitrust laws. What you have to do is to assume there's some subtle, subtle form of market domination, and I've never seen a successful case at that form. In fact, I would go further. Um, now I'm going to side with Troy on this. Once you get generic drugs into the market, one of the things that you see happen is that they, they don't last as long in terms of periods of time as you might expect, because if they're multiple generics, it turns out none of them find it in their interest to advertise. So that's one of the reasons why, if you listen to the earlier discussion, the new, the new Merck drug comes in because it's backed in the way in which metformin is not. One of the things I think that should be allowed, and the explicit approval of the Justice Department should be that you would always allow all generics to join in an advertisement, tell you what the nature of the drug is, and list the 17 companies that make it, each with their website, and say, go get it. And at that particular point, you'd be able to overcome a collective action problem, which will put greater pressure on the new guys coming in. Um, so I think, in effect, that there are ways that you can handle this situation. The antitrust stuff is really extremely complicated in these kinds of industries, and, and I hope I'm getting it across that it just doesn't all cut in one direction. Uh, sometimes you're really worried about it in, in the sense that it's not enforced. Sometimes you're worried about it because it's over-enforced. 
Thank you. Um, moving away from the legal and the quantitative, uh, if we may, and perhaps segueing into tomorrow morning, I have a question about quality of care and quality of patient uh, feelings about care with regard to, uh, in the context of the deprofessionalization, uh, hospice care and end of life issues. Uh, as we have several states now that have death with dignity laws and uh, there seems to be some growing interest in other states to allow uh, people to choose uh, at the end of life and the greater uh, intersection of hospice care there, don't, do you think that turning over some of that thanatology, if you will, might uh, improve the profession or not? Turn it over to whom? To hospice oh, sure. uh, caregivers, to those uh, in the medical are, profession are, who focus on that? Aren't we doing that? It's happening. This is the whole point about deprofessionalization, getting non-physicians to provide health care services. And I don't think anyone's opposed. The question, the real question is how you measure, and, and let me again just do it as a management science observation, which is one of the things that you discovered is that you cannot do this stuff without objective metrics, and you cannot do this stuff only with objective metrics. Uh, for example, if you want to find out why all the efforts at the national level to evaluate school education is the only thing they do is they give you a test and they don't look into a classroom. Um, and if you're running an operation, for example, like Teach for America, they know how to actually send somebody into a classroom and do both qualitative and, and metrics. You have to develop those metrics for health care, and, and that's something which doctors are a necessary input to, but it really takes a lot of different kinds of professionals to do it. Thank you. Um, I I'm going to thank the panelists, um, the Dr. Brennan, Paul Starr, Richard Epstein. Where did Troy go? Uh, Troy, Troy is right there. I can see him. Where is he? Where? <laughs> well, well, well yeah, we know you're running out on this guy. Good luck. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Chris Castle and Arthur Rubenstein for the first half, and the audience for your wonderful participation and questions. We'll resume tomorrow morning about uh, 8 o'clock, I think. And thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>